William Wynn from Fly Corvair, coming up right now. All right, so first question of the day, talking about aircraft engine, is uh, what exactly is a Corvair flight engine? A uh, Corvair flight engine, uh, derived from a Chevrolet Corvair car engine. Uh, they made 1.8 million Corvairs in uh, the 1960s, and uh, it's been flying continuously since 1960 in experimental aircraft. Uh, they are all six-cylinder engines. Uh, they uh, ran from the factory from 140 cubic inches to 164. And uh, as we build them today, we build them uh, from 164 to 200 cubic inches. What type of ignition system is used on this engine? The ignition is, uh, is uh, redundant, uh, but not uh, complete duplication. It has single spark plugs, but they're driven by two different uh, spark sources. So it has uh, points on one side, a uh, very traditional setup that's uh, extremely low technology and totally reliable. And on the other side, it has uh, electronic ignition. So you have the advantages of uh, both systems. On the topic of ignition, uh, and the older systems, legacy systems that do have dual ignition, what is the, the advantage of why did they, they use that back in the day and, and why is that not necessary on this engine? Well, uh, it depends on uh, what the manufacturer's goals are. Uh, in particular, uh, traditional aircraft engines uh, driven by magnetos have uh, spark plug gaps about 16 thousandths of an inch. Uh, and that's prone to fouling. Uh, modern car engine has a spark plug gap of uh, 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 30 to 35 thousandths in the case of Corvairs. And that's much more resistant to uh, fouling, plus the spark is much hotter. We run a 40 thousand volt ignition system on it. So uh, spark plug fouling almost unknown in Corvair flight engines. So we can tolerate having one spark plug per cylinder. If you lose one cylinder out of six, if you fouled a spark plug off, you're down to about 78 to 80% power, uh, which is uh, an annoyance, uh, but it would not be, a, uh, uh, would not be an emergency uh, under the circumstances where you had a four cylinder engine uh, that was uh, potentially uh, prone to spark plug fouling. If you lost one cylinder, you'd be significantly down on power. Uh, and it would be uh, uh, an, a, an attention-getting emergency. Okay, so this is a different ignition system than a legacy aircraft, meaning you don't have a magneto, but you still have obviously a battery and you have a alternator. So how long could you run on either one of those if one of those systems failed? Well, the point of why we selected the particular electronic ignition system that we use is that it will run all the way down to six volts and uh, points will run at six volts also. Uh, the typical battery that starts a uh, Corvair flight engine is an Odyssey 545, and the engine can literally run uh, on that battery. If it started the engine, it could literally run uh, eight or 10 hours without any trouble at all. Uh, points ignitions and little electronic ignitions, uh, points replacements, uh, they're using about one amp per thousand RPM at the most. So that's a long run on a battery. Independently, the uh, Corvair can run off the permanent magnet dynamo that's uh, on it. So you have uh, two sources of electricity, you have two in, uh, independent uh, uh, ignition sources, and they're resolved to uh, single spark plugs. Talking about the exhaust system, is this uh, open header, uh, muffled, or what, what is the exhaust system used here? The exhaust system uh, is a stainless steel uh, piece that we uh, manufacture here in the shop. I weld them up personally. They're all made out of 304 stainless. It's uh, an interesting system that it's a hybrid of CNC machine parts and uh, bent, uh, mandrel bent tubing. Uh, it's all purged, TIG welded here. The system itself, a lot of guys look at it and they say, oh, this would do much better with a very elaborate header system. Uh, uh, that's true if it was a high RPM engine, but this is really a low RPM engine and the uh, valve overlap and the cam timing, uh, uh, it does not make that much of a difference. Uh, most Corvairs, uh, if you fly one uh, and you hear one overhead in the pattern, it's a very smooth sound and it's pretty much quieter than a 172 in the pattern, even though it has no mufflers. Again, uh, a lot of the exhaust note is due to uh, the short uh, valve timing. Uh, and the short uh, duration on the cam, but a lot of lift. So uh, a lot of the cylinder is done being burnt by the time the exhaust valve opens. The system is designed essentially for low surface area under the cowling and lightweight. Two of them. 
the most popular questions and discussions about engines, of course, especially in light sport and experimental, is weight and horsepower. So on those topics, what does this weigh in at and produce? Hey, before we get too deep into this, let me thank our sponsors that make all of this possible. Great companies like Airworks, AirTech Coatings, Clemens Insurance Agency, Acme Aero, Stoll Creek Aviation, Wheelan Aerospace Technologies. So take a moment after this video to say hello to all of them and remember to check out the affiliate links in the description below. And remember, just build it. Let's get back to it. Uh that those are the two uh, most common questions that people ask, uh, and it's uh, important stuff, but I don't think that it uh, gets to the fundamental advantages of particular engines. Uh, Corvair engine installation, as we've been doing them for uh, uh, now 30 years, uh, a modern installation, say in the last 15 years, weighs slightly less than an O200. Uh, that puts it in the weight category uh, uh, with uh, virtually the same as uh, s uh, some other modern engines like Vikings. Uh, so uh, that's in the sort of middleweight uh, engine possibilities for a Zenith. Uh, it's about 40 pounds lighter than a uh, 235 Lycoming, and it's approximately uh, uh, 40 pounds heavier than uh, a 912 Rotax. And what is the, uh, the standard factory, if you will, option for horsepower, and what does it go up to? Uh, we teach people how to build engines, and we also build engines ourselves, uh, but the engine horsepower range is from 100 to 125 plus. So the other question, of course, people ask a lot is the TBO. Both you know, legacy engines are 1,500 to 2,000 hours typically. Uh, what would this um, be considered for a TBO? Uh, a lot of really good legacy engines will go uh, 2,000 to uh, 2,600 hours without much trouble uh, if they are uh, not an overhaul, but they are factory new. What we're teaching people to do is build a new engine out of their Corvair to new standards. Uh, Corvairs, uh, we modestly say they'll go 1,500 hours. Uh, if you do have to overhaul it, uh, our educational program teaches you to be the aircraft mechanic, so overhauling it wouldn't be a big deal. If you go through the engine and replace every single moving wearing component in it, uh, it is uh, approximately a two to $3,000 venture to overhaul it. Uh, if you used your own labor, it wouldn't uh, uh, be a factor there. It's an inexpensive engine. Uh, to overhaul. It's, uh, if you look at it uh, on the initial conversion, there are components like a starter and the prop hub, uh, which will uh, never wear out, uh, and you would not at overhaul need to replace those. So the overhaul cost is a small fraction of the initial uh, uh, build cost on the motor. About how many hours is the longest running um, Corvair or Corvairs out there, and about how many are flying? They're about the fleet of Corvair. Uh, aircraft is uh, about 500. Uh, on any given weekend, uh, you probably have about 300 to 325 that could go flying in America. There are a lot of things that are uh, older projects that are in storage that are still on the FAA registry, but there's a solid 300, 325 uh, flying that represent sort of modern uh, stuff. If we uh, look at uh, the highest time Corvair engine uh, individually I know is uh, shade under 1800 hours, but we've looked at a lot of engines that uh, looked inside at a thousand hour mark and there's no significant wear on the inside of the engine at a thousand hours. It's really operating uh, at a very low power output uh, compared to what it did in the car and certainly a low RPM limit. The RPM that we use is uh, up to uh, in cruise, uh, approximately 32, 3300. Uh, in the car, uh, it was uh, uh, red lined at, uh, uh, yellow lined at uh, 5500. Uh, in off road applications, they turn 7500 all the time. So we're using a tiny fraction of the engine's proven RPM potential. And then for power output, uh, Corvairs uh, came in many horsepower ratings, but they were the first mass produced turbocharged car, uh, rated up to 180 horsepower in the car. Uh, so we uh, at 5200 RPM. So uh, we're not asking any of the uh, uh, proven power output from the engine. That's why it lasts and that's why it has a good cooling record. There's no magic there. If you flat rate the engine down to 60% of its proven automotive levels, uh, it will have a good track record. 
So in reality, you could fly this all day long firewalled as long as you weren't getting hot in a climb. Uh, there is uh, no RPM uh, limit on the engine uh, that you're going to encounter in a direct drive aircraft situation. Uh, our manuals state that 3,600 RPM for all the engines, uh, and it, with the exception of the 3.3 uh, liter, the 3.3 liter uh, is 3,400 continuous. But we've had plenty of pilots uh, fly them up in uh, 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 th those types of ratings uh, for hours at a crack. We have uh, several pilots who uh, believe uh, in the Steve Whitman method, which is the uh, throttle goes in uh, on the takeoff roll and it comes out when you're ready to land. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, if you have uh, some engines, that's probably not a good idea. There are some limitations that you should respect from every manufacturer. But uh, in a Corvair engine, uh, that's not really a factor. If you have a prop that's appropriate for a direct drive airplane on it, uh, you don't really have to uh, be concerned about uh, RPM limits on it. It's far, far under what it ever did in the car. Talk to me about fuel options for a minute. What types of fuels can or should you not run with this engine? Uh, on fuel options, uh, they, uh, uh, if you have an engine that's uh, restricted to either automotive fuel or restricted that it doesn't like 100 low lead, uh, you're going to put a builder in a bind somewhere. So right from the get-go, uh, all the uh, testing, selection, the piston design, everything that we put into it was based on the idea that some of the time you're going to operate on 100 low lead and some of the time you're going to operate on automotive fuel. Uh, most common question is, uh, is it bothered by ethanol in the gas? And it does not care about ethanol in the gas. You got to watch your fuel systems and make sure the fuel system in terms of everything all the way back to the uh, uh, fuel filler cap gasket uh, likes ethanol. But everything internally to the engine does not care about ethanol. And we have uh, particular designs for uh, fast burn uh, pistons based on having a very, very tight quench area where they will effectively work with uh, fuels down into the 90 octane range uh, and uh, but they will equally uh, burn 100 low lead most people uh, forget that 100 low lead uh, is uh, corrosive to valves in the presence of moisture uh, it's uh, not uh, works great to uh, suppress detonation if you need it uh, but it is tough lead build up on the inside of motors and you have to select components with that in mind uh, the valves and the seats that we use, and uh, a lot of the components like the rings are designed to operate in engines that have leaded fuel. Uh, a lot of people uh, miss that, but it's an important component if you want the engine to last. We also use exhaust valve rotators to keep the uh, exhaust valve uh, uh, clean. It's just uh, an important part of giving people the option on any given day of running either fuel that they encounter. The lead time on engines varies. There's always some guy who wants to call you and say, uh, three days before Oshkosh, uh, can I get an engine? Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, that's not really uh, practical. And uh, for some reason, that guy never calls Christmas week where you could produce it in three days without any problem. Uh, but uh, for real planning purposes, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, 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 produce the specific engine that uh, somebody wants. The engines come in a big variety of displacements. They come with varied compression ratios. Uh, they uh, have a lot of different options to them. So somebody doesn't, I don't, uh, uh, we, we have engines uh, that are available, but you know, I'll listen to the builder and find out what kind of fuels he's going to operate, what kind of airplane, what kind of situ situation, what kind of uh, density altitudes, what kind of budget he has, all types of stuff and I would much prefer to build him the specific uh, Corvair that applies to his case rather than talk him into something that uh, is the one-size-fits-all uh, solution. So, so, so near, what you're saying is nearly every one is a custom bill. It's not just an off-the-shelf uh, type of thing, it's essentially. It's a, uh, it's a, each engine is a, a selection from maybe uh, eight proven formulas that I uh, steer people to, but that's a fairly big uh, variety. and. Uh, the, Typically, if you look at a 2700 100 horsepower uh, Corvair, that engine uh, quite literally costs uh, approximately uh, half of what the really flagship high-end engines like the 3.3 cost. So uh, it's uh, uh, both are a good value. The thing is you just have to uh, uh, be willing to listen to the builder and find out uh, which is the particular engine that'll serve his needs. 
Uh, I've often referred to it uh, as an automotive conversion engine. Uh, some people uh, uh, look at that as a derogatory term, but it really is an engine that's converted into an airplane engine. It's not as it was coming out of the car. There's almost nothing in the engine that's untouched. Uh, the basic layout of the horizontally opposed six-cylinder air-cooled engine, uh, that was great, and that's what's been used in Corvairs. In the early models, they were as they were pulled out of cars, but uh, in the last uh, uh, oh, 30 years anyway, people have been uh, looking at uh, electric starters and much more sophisticated engines. So, so, so after stripping away all the old and wanting to bring it refreshed, what, what parts do you produce, pull off the shelf, and bolt on this to make this a 2020 aircraft engine? Uh, well, there's the traditional parts. We have uh, uh, every engine's a direct drive engine, so they all need a uh, prop hub, and we manufacture gold prop hubs. Uh, we make starter kits with uh, very sophisticated, lightweight, permanent magnet uh, geared starters. Uh, we make the ignition systems uh, that are the dual ignition systems that are uh, points on one side and electronic on the other. But I also make a lot of components like uh, high volume oil pumps. Uh, they, every engine has a fifth bearing on the front. A fifth bearing is an additional bearing bolted onto the front end of the engine to take the flight loads. Uh, traditional Corvairs of, uh, of uh, 50 years ago did not utilize this. In the modern era, every Corvair engine needs a fifth bearing. And they're available. In a, uh, moving forward from there, uh, uh, with uh, some really uh, high-end engines, uh, uh, outfits like Sport Performance Aviation uh, make billet made in the United States crankshafts that are made from actual Timken billets. These things have been around uh, 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 eight years and they have an outstanding track record in aerobatic aircraft like Panthers. So uh, we have a full range of options for people. Uh, you can work uh, uh, with uh, uh, parts that we've uh, aimed at making uh, completely flight worthy uh, but with an eye towards uh, a little bit of a budget build, and on the other end of the scale, uh, uh, we uh, uh, have uh, some really spectacular products uh, available to home builders who choose uh, Corvair Power. Okay. As far as the education side, if somebody, uh, which would be the primary thing that you like to do, is teach people, uh, what are the different resources you have set in place, uh, books, DVDs, the, the Corvair College? Talk to me about the education por portion of it. Uh, education is what it's all about. Uh, if uh, you just want to buy an engine, uh, then any salesman will do. Uh, but if you want to learn about engines, you want to be the master of your own engine, then you got to have somebody who uh, not only understands the engine, but is uh, geared to uh, communicate it with you. I'm a fairly prolific writer. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, my websites uh, over the last uh, 30 years have thousands of pages of information on them. Uh, if you, uh, we have DVDs, I have manuals that uh, are the starting point. The basic conversion manual uh, is the starting point for all Corvair engine builds. So we have the printed information and the online information uh, in quantity and quality. Going from there, uh, we offer in-person training. Uh, we have now held uh, 44 Corvair colleges. Uh, the Corvair College is a setting where you come and work on your own motor at the college, and we teach people hands-on skills. Uh, when you learn to fly, you didn't learn to fly by reading a book. You learn to fly uh, uh, by going and seeing a flight instructor and doing it in person. And in a lot of ways, uh, engine building is best taught uh, in person. We also have one-on-one uh, -on -one engine build sessions down here at my hangar. Uh, we have small group settings uh, where we have uh, weekends where several builders come in. But the name of the game is, uh, uh, my goal is to make uh, everybody a, a skilled owner-operator and the master of their own engine. It doesn't mean that you're going to be an uh, automotive machinist when you come out. That's not the goal. The goal is to be a skilled owner-operator and know what's inside of it. Once you learn all that stuff, you'll be amazed at how little other people actually, that you assumed understood something about engines, uh, you'll, you'll understand why they work. Uh, this is a, an important feature. Uh, my background is in aviation safety, and uh, the, you can look as long as you like, and uh, as far as you want to, you will never find anybody hurt in an airplane because they knew too much or were too skilled in operating it. Uh, but accident reports every day 
offer evidence that uh, people who didn't understand what they were doing uh, got in trouble. So the best defense uh, against uh, uh, any type of trouble or unnecessary risk in airplanes is understanding the machine that, you, that you're operating. Uh, but we live in an environment where many people uh, are satisfied to simply buy something. If you're a little different than that, and what you're really looking for is uh, knowledge and understanding and uh, the pride of uh, building your own engine, we're here to assist. And I got a lot of different ways to transfer the information to people. I understand you've just overhauled your website, uh, got some new information out there. Where can people go to learn more at your website and get in touch with you to ask questions direct? Uh, the one thing that's uh, the biggest uh, misunderstanding is people, uh, when they get on the telephone with me, they say, uh, wow, it's, uh, you know, it's the engine guru, William Wynn. I'm actually on the phone with him, as if I have 5,000 active builders. It doesn't really work that way. There's a lot of people who have websites that want you to believe that they have uh, 6,000 new customers this year and they're uh, really important and they're General Electric or something like that. But in reality, uh, uh, most smaller engine companies, uh, one of the advantages that we have is uh, I pick up about 50 new builders a year. And uh, that's not uh, earth shattering numbers, but the reality is that it's personal service. Uh, my uh, phone number is uh, easily accessible off the website. Uh, you can uh, uh, call me up anytime, and I'm glad to uh, speak to builders directly. Uh, our websites, flycorbear.com and flycorbear.net, uh, very popular and have been around for many, many years. Uh, the, uh, we have WW Fly Corbear as a Facebook group, and WW Fly Corbear is also a YouTube channel. But the main thing is that I'm directly accessible to builders because I go to Oshkosh every year and go to other major air shows, and we hold the Corbear Colleges. But uh, again, uh, 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 the, you know, there will be plenty of people who pretend they have uh, so many builders they can't talk to you. But in reality, uh, uh, I have a very, very large fan base of uh, builders, uh, and it was built one builder at a time over uh, 31 years. So uh, if you think that uh, you'd like to be one of those guys uh, and you'd like to learn something, I'm glad to help you out. Thanks for watching the first episode of our Engine Week series. Return tomorrow for our next episode here on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.